Okay, to start off, <coughs> I'd like to spend some time going over question six. This question six involves a phase change and involves us calculating state changes, which is what we're going to be covering today. So a lot of what you need to do to solve six, if you've never seen thermodynamics before, we technically haven't covered it quite enough. Uh, so I just want to go over what I'm looking for and then some approximations to make the problem simpler. So what I'm looking for, <coughs> excuse me, Ultimately, I'm looking for a large table that should look pretty similar to the steam tables in the back of the book, where we're going from 0 0.01 degrees Celsius all the way down to 110 degrees Celsius, which is the saturated conditions for one atmosphere pressure. Now, if we were to increase the pressure, then that would, of course, suppress the boiling of the liquid toluene, and you could take this and get liquid properties going to higher and higher temperatures up until the critical point. At which point, when you have a critical point, you no longer have any differences between liquids and vapors, and they become the same thing. This is what we'll be talking about next week. So today in class, we're going to be covering uh, the last of state changes, and then next week we're going to talk about multi-phase single component systems, and then eventually multi-phase multi-component systems and then uh, basically wrap up all the thermal that we're going to talk about. So, <clears throat> the first thing that this problem says is to assume a reference state of the liquid at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. Now this is exactly the reference state that's used typically for steam tables. So if you go in your steam tables and you look, but it's usually the internal energy. The internal energy of liquid water at just above the freezing point is going to be zero. So what we basically say is we call this zero enthalpy, and we call this zero entropy. So a couple of approximations and assumptions here. So we want to assume ideal gas behavior for the vapor. For the liquid, I also made an additional assumption here. We're going to assume that the volume doesn't change very much as a function of temperature. Otherwise, we'll need more information. So basically, we're going to say that this is going to be equal to zero, which allows us to calculate basically all the properties from a very, very limited subset of information. Basically, just the heat capacity and heat of vaporization is all we need to, call to solve most everything else. Um, <clears throat> but if you recall from Thermo, the class that we're in, right? Uh, the density of the fluid is another really important property. But in the absence of density, if we just neglect the volume expansion of the toluene as we heat it, that allows us to solve a lot of the problems. And then, of course, for the vapor phase, we're going to assume ideal gas behavior, which gives us this relationship for how much the gas expands when you heat it up. And the last thing we'll need. is the heat of vaporization we need to grab from, sorry, the vapor pressure we need to grab from Anton's relationship. So what I've done is I've posted in the resources section of Canvas a, uh, a, a scanned copy of a good table that I like for Anton's equations from the Smith, Van Ness, and Abbott book. So it has the units in kilopascals, which is what my preferred units are, and it's got it listed for a lot of different compounds. So the Sandler book, for some reason, I don't know why it doesn't have good vapor pressure information, um, but Smith, Ennis, and Abbott, I'm stealing it from there. Now, the reason why this comes into play is because when we're talking about the entropy of a vapor, it's going to be a strong function of pressure. Liquid properties, by neglecting this, we're effectively saying that the pressure is not having a significant impact on the saturated liquid properties. So that when we're dealing with the 
enthalpy for the vapor, we only have to worry about heat capacity more or less. But when we're talking about the entropy changes, we have to consider what the pressure of the system is because we're talking about a saturated liquid tolerant vapor. Sorry, saturated liquid and saturated vapor telling me table, not paper. And then this delta G here serves as a double check. So in the problem, you're provided the heat of vaporization at T equals 110 degrees Celsius. This gives us a pathway to know how much energy it takes to phase transition from a liquid to a vapor, but this is only valid under these temperature conditions right here. So, should we expect the heat of vaporization to increase or decrease as we go to, let's say, higher or lower temperatures? Let's start off with going to higher is easier. So as we increase the temperature, the only way we can maintain a liquid right is to increase the pressure. Does the heat of vaporization go down the higher the temperature we get? Decreases. Or does it go up? Decreases. Increases or decreases? What was this? So everyone who says increase, raise your hand. Everyone who says decrease, raise your hand. Okay, all of those who didn't vote. Okay, most everyone committed eventually. All right, so let's, have, let's figure out why. Why? Why does the heat of vaporization decrease as you increase the temperature? Wendell, give me your best shot. Um, because the distance between the molecules increase. Um, more generally, uh, that may be true from a molecular perspective. I don't. I'd have to think about that. Who knows? Yeah. I, I can think of the room with the critical point mm -hmm. at the above. And so what happens? Yeah. What happens at the critical point? There is no need of polarization. The, the liquid and vapor are the same, and when, when we increase the temperature, the, the, the difference between liquid and vapor is it's very narrow. Then it's, it's becoming a point at a critical point. So moving from liquid to vapor. Exactly. As you get closer and closer to the critical point, the differences between a liquid and vapor get smaller and smaller and smaller until the properties of the liquid exactly match the properties of the vapor. Make sense? The other thing is, okay, let's ask another question then, expanding on the same idea. What should have a higher heat capacity? A liquid or a vapor? Which of those two has a higher heat capacity? This is effectively exactly the same question as how does the heat of vaporization change as a function of temperature? So who just gut reaction, who says that gases should have a higher heat capacity? Raise your hand. Got a couple. Who says liquid should have a higher heat capacity? Okay, team liquid, defend it. It takes more energy to heat it up. And... Molecule's the same, though. So what's different about liquids as opposed to gases? They have to change the phase. No interfaces. So one thing to keep in mind, when we're talking about classical thermodynamics, every system is infinite in size. So when I talk about water, I'm talking about an infinite ocean where the entire universe is water. There's no interface. But what that really means in practice is that the interface is so small that it contributes insignificantly to the overall energy of the system. So everything in thermodynamics is infinite in size, boundaryless, to a good approximation. Yeah. Because the liquids are more tightly packed together, so there's more material for heat to be absorbed into? Uh, of sorts, yes. The, the, the answer is that when you're a liquid, you have to deal with other molecules. When you're a gas, it's only yourself. When you're an ideal gas, the only thing you have to worry about is, you know, my, the local bonding structure of the compound. But when you're a liquid, you have intermolecular poles and pushes that prevent and inhibit your interaction. So what happens then when you increase your temperature, and your liquid becomes more like a vapor, the only way that that's possible, right, heat capacity, C sub P, is defined as how the enthalpy changes with respect to temperature at constant pressure. So if we are to look at a plot of the enthalpy of liquid and vapor as a function of temperature, the heat capacity is the slope. So if I'm starting off here at 25 degrees at room temperature, 
let's say this is 25. One of these is going to be liquid, one of these is going to be vapor. Which is this? Is this liquid or the vapor? Right, and then this would be the heat of vaporization at 25, right? At 25. Let's say over here, this is the critical point. Right, the critical point is going to have a higher enthalpy than the liquid or the vapor because it's at a higher temperature. Energy always increases in the system when you increase the temperature. Heat capacity is always positive. So if we assume constant heat capacity, which is not true, right? These two fluids have to meet at the critical point to have the same enthalpy, the same density, the same entropy, the same everything. They all have to have exactly the same properties at the critical point. Now, in reality, the shape is more like this, right, where the, the heat capacity does change as a function of temperature, but you can see that the slope is always higher for the liquid because the liquid has to deal with other molecules. And that raises the heat capacity because there's, you kind of have to knock other molecules out of the way, which takes some energy. The last thing we need to solve this <clears throat> is that at a phase transition, which is what we'll talk about on Wednesday next week, the, the delta G of the phase transition is equal to zero, which means that the Gibbs of the vapor minus the Gibbs of the liquid is equal to the same thing. Right, delta G, meaning going from liquid to the vapor, final minus initial. That's our delta G of the phase transition. So the delta G of any phase transition is always going to be equal to zero. You don't need that many equations to solve this, but you need to structure your, your, your thought process reasonably well in order to make this problem be a lot, lot smoother. And we're cheating a little bit. I mean, in truth be told, we should have the liquid density values to do a more accurate calculation of this. But the cool thing about this process is that with very limited information, right, a heat, heat capacity correlation and vapor pressure and heat of vaporization at one condition, we can basically fill out an entire table. And this is exactly what happens for steam tables, because for the steam tables, we don't have an entropy meter. We're relying on thermodynamics to tell us how to calculate the entropy. That is the only way we ever have access to get to the entropy. So the process that we're doing here is a little bit hand wavy version of what people would have done to make the steam tables originally. So really all they need to do is calorimetry and density measurements and with those two values we can basically figure everything else out. And also the heat of vaporization, they don't actually measure the heat of vaporization with the calorimeter. What they do is they measure the saturation pressure and use the clausius clapeyron equation to calculate the heat of vaporization. So there's a lot of really, trick, really cool shortcuts that people do in thermodynamics um, that makes their lives a lot easier. Okay. Hopefully this gives us a little bit more physical intuition of, uh, of what's going on in the problems. Okay. Now today, for the uh, new content, this is the last day that we're effectively going to be talking about state property changes, which is kind of the emphasis, you know, energy balance plus state changes is really all we're doing on homework one. Now, on homework two, we're going to be introducing more non-ideal state changes. Right, how do these change? Because right now we're all doing ideal gas. What happens when we have a Van der Waal fluid, or a Virial fluid, or a Pang Robinson fluid? And we'll have to repeat all these calculations, but with a more complex equation of state. So, what we covered last class is we derived a couple of relations. Now we're going to apply them today. So, <clears throat> changes in the internal energy, we related that to changes in temperature through the heat capacity, and then we have this big other fancy mess that most of the time we have ignored because most all calculations at the undergraduate level are ideal gas relationships. It just so happens that if you plug in the ideal gas law for this term, it goes away. And that's why ideal gas is the heat capacity is only a function of temperature. It's not a function of the density of the fluid. And this makes intuitive sense because if we compress an ideal gas, the, assum the assumption of an ideal gas is that there is no interaction between the molecules. So regardless of how close you get the molecules on an ideal gas, the fundamental assumption of it is that they don't see each other. So the distance doesn't matter. And the relationship of the ideal gas law does fit that as well. 
enthalpy has a similar relationship, but instead of changing the specific volume, we change the uh, pressure. Again, this whole term will go to zero for the ideal gas law, as it should. Same logic applies. Changing the pressure is the same thing as basically changing the density. And then for entropy, we expanded it in two different ways. One as a function of temperature and pressure, and one as temperature and volume. don't have to memorize these, they are on the equation sheet. So for every exam, for every quiz, for every homework, they're always there waiting to be used. I don't remember that. I know that dH has something dt and something dp, of course, and I can remember this part here. But this expression here, I just look it up, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Most everything that we're going to be doing in thermodynamics has been done for 200 years, 150 years. So all of the equations of state if you want to know what the enthalpy change is for some equation of state, someone's already done this. Someone's integrated this by substituting in this nasty mess here with the partial derivative of, let's say, the virial equation of state, or the Peg Robinson, or the SRK. So the main emphasis that I always want to focus on in this class is getting everyone a good, solid, intuitive understanding of why thermo is as complex and tricky uh, as it seems. Okay, so. <clears throat> Ultimately, the reason why we care about these terms, we also have the Gibbs, which we define as H minus TS, and the Helmholtz, which is defined as A minus TS. Again, I mentioned this before, we don't really have relationships for DA and DG because it'll become clear later on when we talk about multi-component, multi-phase. It's not super useful to calculate the Gibbs. Reasoning behind that is entropy. Just a really quick, really, really quick preview. Uh, it comes into play for the homework on these ones as well. I don't know if it's this homework or maybe it's the next homework. Um, but for example, an ideal gas, what is the entropy as I expand a fluid to uh, a density of zero, sorry, a pressure of zero or infinite specific volume? Let's just think intuitively about this. I have a piston cylinder device, I just expand it forever until it gets to outer space. So I'm giving basically every molecule in that system an infinite amount of volume. What's my entropy go to? It goes to infinity. That's a problem. Same thing applies to when we mix two fluids together. So if I've got a bucket or a bin of all component A, remember, this is classical thermodynamics. There's no boundaries. There's no interfaces. This is infinite. It's an infinite ocean. We're neglecting any barriers or walls. And I add in a little bit of component B to the system. That's exactly the same analogy. I have taken B, and I have given it an infinite new volume to work in, which is the fluid A. That means that fluid B effectively gains an infinite amount of entropy. This throws a wrench into the Gibbs free energy calculation. So in order to overcome this complication, we invented something called the fugacity. The fugacity is the deviation in the Gibbs free energy of a real fluid relative to the deviation of the Gibbs, or so rather relative to the Gibbs free energy of an ideal gas. So an ideal gas has this problem. When I mix B into A, I've just given that fluid an infinite amount of entropy. But relative to an ideal gas, it's not infinite. So the fugacity is the whole reason why, through this Gibbs, it's why it's defined. And this will come into play when you actually calculate pathways here for entropy changes. It's a little, a little, little uh, introduction, I guess, to what we'll be talking about in the future a little bit. And that's why we only see typically these four forms we don't typically worry about the dg and dA in terms of the differential for changes in temperature and pressure because it's not super useful. It's much better to calculate this concept called fugacity 
which again is just a made up quantity that happens to be very convenient. And it's convenient because it gets rid of this discontinuity problem. Okay, we'll talk about that a lot more in the future, but I just wanted to give everyone a, a good vision of where we're going with all this. So why we care about this is because we have the first law and second law of thermodynamics. Entropy either stays constant or increases. But how we know what the entropy is, is we have to calculate it based on changes in temperature and pressure. So if I've got a turbine or a boiler or a pump, I want to operate that so I'm not losing any work. So an isentropic turbine in the ranking cycle is the ideal form to do it. Now, of course, you're never going to reach that, but that's the idealized calculation. So if you need to know, if I'm varying the temperature and pressure of my fluid as I'm expanding it and extracting work out of it, I'm going to set my ds equal to zero, and then I'm going to integrate these two different sides of the expression, and I can come up with a relationship for how my pressure and temperature should change over the course of this expanding process. So the reason why we need these relationships here is so we can actually put them into an energy balance and put them into an entropy balance to solve real problems. So all the problems that we've been solving for this week's homework are predominantly steam. So we haven't had to worry about any of this. Someone's already done it for us and calculated all these values in the steam table. Our job now is to understand these relationships so we can build our own steam tables, like for telling me, for example. Make sense? So that's the whole point of where all this is tying in together. So what information do we need to actually solve these relationships? Well, we basically need heat capacity information, and we need a relationship between temperature, volume, and pressure. So what we need is C sub P and or C sub V as a function of temperature, pressure, or specific volume. Now I want you to remember, everything in thermodynamics is a function of everything else in thermodynamics. C sub V is a function of temperature, pressure, specific volume. C sub P is a function of temperature, pressure, specific volume. It just so happens that it's convenient that for C sub V, we focus mostly on changes in temperature and specific volume. For C sub P, we focus mostly on changes in temperature and pressure. But everything's a function of everything. There is no easy outs in thermo. So that's why we're very careful about the paths that we choose. Now, the complication here is that means I need to know the heat capacity for every fluid at every temperature and every pressure. That's not necessarily feasible. All right, we'll talk about how we can address that. And we also need an equation of state that relates temperature, pressure, temperature, and specific volume. So this could be ideal gas law, Pang Robinson, Van der Waals equation. And with this equation, we can calculate dVdt, dPdt, T, P, V. We can substitute it all together. Because ultimately, to evaluate, let's say, this relationship right here, I need to get everything as a function of only the pressure. Or at least I need to get it so I can integrate the pressure by holding you know, temperature or volume constant. So to address this right here, what we can do is we can derive a expressions for how does the heat capacity change as a function of oops, pressure and specific volume. Right, so we can drive relationships for these right here. It's a fun little exercise. We don't end up using them because this isn't the best pathway. But it gives us a step forward to realize that all of these are functions of everything. So ideally then, if we had this information, the goal then is we could measure the heat capacity of an ideal gas. An ideal gas occurs at the state of pressure is equal to zero, or specific volume is equal to infinity. So for an ideal gas, we call this C sub P with a star and C sub B with a star that are related through this relationship that we derive for ideal gases. We put a little star to remind us that this is for ideal gas properties. The heat capacity and the properties of an ideal gas, at least in terms of enthalpy and, uh, and, and internal energy, are only a function of temperature. So with C sub P star as a function of temperature plus C sub P 
dp as a function of t, and d c sub b dv as a function of t. Right? So in theory, if we only had access to the heat capacity of the ideal gas, plus a relationship to integrate us to whatever temperature and pressure we were concerned with, we could then apply these relationships here to solve for the internal energy or the entropy or the enthalpy for any set of temperatures and pressures, plus an equation of state. That's really all we need to solve all the <coughs> thermodynamics. The complication is that we don't really have a good equation of state for liquids. That's one of the biggest issues. Oh yeah, so to accomplish this task, again, this is one of these uh, thermoderivations where we already know the answer, so I get to skip all the confusing parts where I'm banging my head against the wall, and I just get to cool, derive straight forward to the right answer. So we're going to expand du uh, with respect to uh, temperature and pressure, no, sorry, temperature and volume. Same, same approach that we've taken in the past. So what we're going to do now is we're going to basically take the same approach to what we've done to derive a maximal relation. We're going to take these two terms and then swap the order of the derivatives. So d d v at constant t times d Right, those two are equivalent. All I'm doing is switching the order that I'm taking the partial derivative. And what we get out of this is it falls into our relationship right here where we have CV is equal to this guy there. And all of that business is equal to that mess over there. I'll write it out. So this gives us a relationship for D, so the change in the heat capacity as a function of changes in density while holding the temperature constant is going to be equal to the partial derivative with respect to temperature of this big mess over here. T, P, at constant V, I don't understand how those are connected. So. Ah, because, so this is the combined first and second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be true all the time, no matter what. This is just a general calculus relationship. Where we're expanding the internal energy with respect oh, to I changes see. in no, temperature. I got it. Oh, yeah. And so then the differentials are the same, which means that those two terms have to be the same. Yeah, got it. But one of the key things I always, I really like, like what, what sort of, you know, lit a flame in my heart for thermodynamics, I guess, right, is, is the Gibbs phase rule or the notion that you only need, there's only three variables in thermodynamics for any single component fluid. That really is what triggered the aha moment for me of why we can always just magically come up with these ridiculous derivations. The key to thermo is that those three variables, and I feel like it doesn't get enough attention. At least for me, that's what opened the mathematics in my mind. Okay, so this expression right here, um, we're going to assume that everything's a function of everything in thermo, right? So we have to keep everything alive through the product rule. So what this tells us then is that uh, we have to do first times the derivative of second, second times the derivative of first. So it's t d squared t d t squared at function of v plus uh, dt dt is 1, so then this gives us dp. And then derivative of this is minus dp dt at constant v. And they two cancel out. And so we come up with our final relationship, 
and we can do exactly the same approach but with slightly different math to do the same thing for C sub P. So again, an equation of state is critical to our understanding of thermodynamics. We need to know how temperature, pressure, and specific volume are related for a fluid. So again, equations of state are way more than just what's the pressure in the gas tank or the gas cylinder. So if we wanted to evaluate these expressions here, not using an ideal gas state, we would have to come up with a relationship for the heat capacity, for example, at some pressure and temperature. And by integrating these expressions here, um, I'll call this P2, have to integrate this expression using an equation of state and then we can determine what the heat capacity was at some arbitrary temperature and pressure. I'm sorry. So what this expression is saying is we're going to start off with our initial condition of a heat capacity of an ideal gas that unfortunately we have to measure but now with sort of quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics simulations we can get an estimate of this. We're going to integrate from pressure is equal to zero, which is our ideal gas scenario, all the way to whatever the system pressure is, P2. Integrating this expression, which we would then substitute in something that's an equation of state. For the ideal gas law, let's just do a really quick sanity check. BV equals RT. So again, I'm really bad at this kind of calculus, so I always have to rewrite the equation. So it looks like a, a function that I'm used to seeing in you know, like pre-calculus or calculus one or something. Uh, the second derivative here of, 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 of V with respect to temperature is equal to zero. 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 Right, so it goes away. So good. We haven't sort of broken our understanding. And then, of course, we could write the same expression for uh, C sub V as opposed to C sub P. Uh, but in the case of, let, let me just write it out really quickly, uh, just to make one more point. In the case of the ideal gas scenario, right, P is equal to zero, and volume, specific volume, is equal to infinity. So we're, when we're going in and out of the ideal gas state, we're going to go in and out of infinity or pressure equals zero. <coughs> So this adds in a little complication when we talk about entropy here. It's because if you've looked at the, uh, the equation sheet very closely, you're familiar with calculating changes in entropy, right? There's always that natural log when we deal with these two terms right here usually. So zeros and infinities are not very welcome in natural logs. Uh, so what ends up happening is you'll have to kind of, you know, play around with the math a little bit and it'll work out eventually. But the complication that entropy goes to infinity as the pressure goes to zero, that's valid. But the problem is you don't stay at infinity. You use it as a pathway. OK. So now let's actually talk about how we can solve some real problems. So if I have a system, 
And I'm looking here at a plot of pressure versus temperature. And I want to go from some condition of temperature initial, or T1, and pressure initial, P1, all the way over here to some temperature T2 and some pressure P2. So this will be our state one, and then this will be our state two. How did we get there? So we could draw a straight line going across. Problem with that is that in our relationships here, our goal is generally going to be trying to calculate the enthalpy and the entropy. That's the information that we'll use most generally for our open system balances. Any process, we need to make sure we're not violating the second law, or oftentimes we'll use the second law to say it's an isentropic process to give us access to the outlet temperature and pressure conditions. Right? So don't forget about the second law of balances. Whenever you're stuck on an energy balance, the key might be through the entropy balance. Enthalpy, we need to know the inlet and outlet enthalpies because that tells us how much heat we have to put into the system or how much work we're going to put in or how much work we're going to get out. And that's the connection between all of this calculus mumbo jumbo compared to when we actually do a balance to figure out how much, you know, what the efficiency of a car is, for example, right? We need this information. So the problem is if we go straight across over here, we're varying both the temperature and the pressure at the same time. And I certainly don't know how to integrate that. So instead, we need to choose paths of straight lines. So we've got a lot of options. We could go straight up, straight over. We could go straight over, straight up. And those would be totally valid approaches, right? So let's say, for example, we consider an isobaric heating, then an isothermal pressurization. Let's talk about this path for a little bit. Let's think about it in terms of enthalpy. <coughs> this is C sub P. It doesn't have a star. This is not the ideal gas heat capacity. <coughs> so if you can approximate pressure one as an ideal gas, then we have access to this information. If we don't approximate this as an ideal gas, well, then we're going to open up a world of hurt. Because that means We've got to apply this relationship to determine the heat capacity at every single point along this path right here. Which means that when I integrate from temperature 1 to temperature 2, inside of that integral here, I substitute my C sub P, which has an integral here, going from pressure 0 to pressure P, integrating this double differential of the equation of state. So I do not recommend that path whatsoever. The second one is really straightforward. Well, relatively straightforward. We're just isothermally pressurizing, which means it doesn't matter what the heat capacity is. I only have to evaluate this using an equation of state. I vote no on that pathway, because I have to do a double integral for every single step along that pathway. So instead, what we do is we add an additional step I'll call it 1A, where I go from whatever system pressure we are at to pressure is equal to zero. That takes me to an ideal gas state. If you do this instead of PT space, but instead in VT space, you would go volume is equal to infinity, and it's the same approach. Then I take a second step, 1B, where I isothermally heat the ideal gas which makes our life a little bit simpler because we know the heat capacity of an ideal gas, and the ideal gas doesn't have to worry about any of the other complexities. And then the final step is we isothermally pressurize it to the real system conditions. So it's a slightly more convoluted path, but in the end, we don't have to uh, worry about the complexity of determining the heat capacity of a real fluid. We can rely on the measurements that we've already made for the ideal gas heat, heat, heat capacity properties. So the pathway then is not too bad at all. So we're going to take our, let's first go through the example looking at enthalpy. So we're going to calculate delta H going from state 1 to state 2. 
So all we need to do is integrate these three individual steps and add them together. So this is going to be delta H going from 1 to 2. It's going to be delta H of 1A plus delta H of 1B plus delta H of 1C. So again, we can also write this as T1, P1 going to T2, P2. Again, that's why we say state 1 and state 2, because it's convenient to know that the state contains all that information that we're talking about. Okay, so 1A, what simplifies out in this expression here? What goes to 0? This term goes to 0 here. So we have to integrate this expression. So we integrate going from, let's get this right, P1 and T1 equal to P equals 0 T1. So the temperature is constant. And this fun expression. Okay. For an ideal gas, we all know this goes to 0, which means ideal gases, you just have to worry about the temperature changes. But for any real fluid, this is going to have a non-zero value. Second step is now we are at pressure equals zero, temperature equals the T1. We're going to heat the ideal gas up, which means this step is easy. So we go from P0 to P0, but T1 to T2 of the heat capacity of the ideal gas. So when we talk about the heat capacity of an ideal gas, it is just whatever the bonding structure is, whatever the vibrations are, whatever the rotations are, a completely unconstrained molecule zipping around space. And that's an easier, thing, easier system for us to understand the model. And then the last step is going to be the opposite of 1. So we're going to go from P equals 0 at T2, temperature 2, to the final system pressure of P2 but at the same temperature, and we just have the integral of this one here, minus. So this term right here is going to be, let's see, the integral is going to be negative, right, because the upper bound, the lower bound is higher than the upper bound. This one's going to be a positive integral. Any questions? So for a real fluid, this is valid for anything. This is valid for solids. This is valid for liquids. This is valid for whatever system we're looking at. Um, well, no, 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 no. mostly for gases, because otherwise you have a phase transition. If you have a phase transition, you can handle that. You just got to add in that additional step if we're dealing with liquids. I wouldn't feel good about this. OK, let's talk about entropy. So the same relationship would hold true if we talked about internal energy. But for internal energy, it makes the most sense, instead of looking at this in PT space, but to look at it in VT space. The only difference is that instead of going from a finite pressure to pressure equals 0, you would go from a finite specific volume to an infinite specific volume. But again, don't be scared. The math works out. Now, entropy. And let's look at our ds. So ds we're going to take exactly the same pathway. So same logic applies here. If we integrate going from state 1 to state 2 of the differential change in entropy, this is just equal to the delta let's see p1 t1 going to p2 t2 this is also equal to the entropy of state 2 minus the entropy of state 1 or we could also write that as the entropy at 
All of these are effectively equivalent ways of writing out what we're doing. Right? Integrating the differential change, looking at the total delta of the process, thinking of the delta as going from P1 to T1 and P2 to T2. This is also the entropy of state 2 minus the entropy of state 1, or the entropy of that temperature and pressure and the entropy of the temperature and pressure. Okay, so our delta S, our total change in entropy of the process, we're going to follow the same pathway, right? Down to ideal gas, heat the ideal gas, repressurize. So step one is a isothermal process. So we are just going from pressure one, temperature one, to pressure equals zero, same temperature of minus D. Step two is we are heating the ideal gas. And step three, we're going to do the reverse of step one to take it all the way up to pressure two. And that's going to take us to pressure zero, temperature two, to pressure two, temperature two. For an example, let's do an exercise here, real quick. Let's just ground ourselves really quickly before we end for the week. Let's just say that we're going to take an ideal gas going from state one to state two. Let's calculate the entropy change just so we can. Remind ourselves how we actually do all of this. Okay, so I'm going to do an isothermal pressurization of an ideal gas. We want to calculate the changes in entropy using our combined first and second law of thermodynamic relationships. Okay, so let's simplify our expression here. What goes to zero in this process? This goes to zero. So our goal is to get delta S. So the change in entropy going from state one to state two is we're just going to integrate our differential rate of change. change in volume with respect to temperature for the ideal gas. R over P. Yes, R over P is equal to. Good at their calculus. What is this equal to? Now the complexity comes into all of this when we start to deal with non-ideal gases because this is not going to be a super simple expression for anything other than an ideal gas. <laughs> More so on these ones here, we're talking about enthalpy changes and internal energy changes. But that concludes everything that we're going to talk about when it comes to state changes. <laughs>
The only other additional complexity that we're going to add into state changes is when we start to talk about multi-component systems. Because when we talk about multi-component systems, you have heats of mixing, entropies of mixing, you have volumes of mixing, and these are additional complexities that we have to add into the system that we don't really have good ways to predict. Activity coefficient models are the goal of trying to predict those properties, but for pure fluids, this is basically it, we're done. So every cycle that we've ever talked about in, 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 in classical thermodynamics, refrigeration cycle, ranking cycle, auto cycle, all these different ones, right? we can use this information to basically fully predict all of those systems. We use state changes combined with energy and entropy balances to give us access to the information of how much heat and work and changes in temperature and pressure all have to occur when we go through a particular real process. So don't lose the connection between these state changes and energy balances. They're two distinct halves of the problem. So to solve any real process, we either need real data or an ability to calculate the properties of the fluids plus the balances. The balances are our gateway to interacting with the system. We can only interact with fluids by giving it work energy or heat energy. That's all we can do with fluids and systems. Right? Pressurizing it is giving it work energy. Changing its volume is taking away work energy, potentially. So don't forget that this is one half of the, the equation. The other half is the energy balance and the entropy balance. So we need that information. When we put those two together, we can solve all these processes. What we're going to be talking about next week is we're going to transition away from single, well, we're still going to stay on single component, but we're going to go away from single phase. We're going to go to multi-component and multi-phase systems. We're first going to talk about um, what is the criteria for when two phases are in equilibrium. That basically gives us the property information when we transition from, let's say, a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor, or from a solid to a liquid, saturated solid to a saturated liquid. Then once we have all of our equilibrium relationships for a single component but multi-phase system, then we're going to redo everything here for multi-component multi-phase. Because just as when you condense something down or pressurize it to, an, to a state that's away from an ideal gas state, if I have like, let's say, a propanol, right, and I have a really, really low pressure, it's going to behave like an ideal gas. As I pressurize the fluid, one propanol molecule is going to get in the way of the other propanol molecule, and it's not going to have access to the same configurations or the same vibrations or the same rotations as it would normally. Right? So if one molecule can get in the way of the other one of the same type, now imagine you have a mixture of water and propanol. Then imagine you have water and propanol in the liquid phase, where we're just cramming them in to so close. Like the, like the, 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 the free space between liquids is very, very minimal. So if one molecule can mess up its interaction with itself, a molecule of a different type is certainly going to cause a whole wrench to go in the system. So we'll have to redevelop new equations of state to handle multi-component systems. And the, the answer is very unsatisfying. We don't really have a good way to do it. So we have a lot of mixing rules and heuristics and tricks, right? So we have this really elegant derivation of thermodynamics until the system gets so complex that we basically say, yeah, forget it, but we'll just approximate it. And we'll talk about the system of how we approximate it. Still works pretty good. It's not 100% accurate, but it's still pretty good. And that's where we're going to go from here on out. All right, please take a look at the homework. Office hours are going to be on Tuesday next week, same time. I think it's 12 to 2. Uh, so please take a look and come ask me any questions that you have at the end. All right, thanks.